Hello, my name's Sam Webster. Um, I teach a bit of anatomy and I set myself a task of producing one anatomy video a week for as long as I could bear. And I've been doing it for over a year and we're still here. Don't know if anybody's watching these videos. <laughs> this week I've been talking about the perineum with students, which is a bit of anatomy we don't talk about very often. Um, but I was talking a lot about the perineum, so it was in my head, so I thought I'd put it down on tape. Shows how old I am, not tape. Put it down on, on the YouTubes. So let's have a look at the perineum. And I'm not talking about the little bit of skin, I'm talking about the space, um, just outside the pelvis. So how much do you know about the bones of the pelvis and the ligaments of the pelvis and the shape of the pelvis and levator ani ani and things like that? We need to consider all of those things really. Um, so if you look inside the pelvis, in there is the pelvis. When you look inside the pelvis, so look, this is superior, this is, so we're looking into, looking into the pelvis here. You can see that we've got this, this bowl shape. Can you see that that's, it's not flat. It's rounded, it's a bowl. Uh, and the muscle forming the floor is levator ani. It's actually three muscles, pubo rectalis, pubo coccygeus, and ilio coccygeus. Why is it called ilio coccygeus? Right, they, if we think about the bones of the pelvis. Right, bones of the pelvis. This is the pubis, this is the ilium, this is the ischium. Um, so if this is like the pelvic aperture, then this is where that's where you've got your levator ani, your pelvic floor, your pelvic diaphragm. And we talk about the pelvic diaphragm in another video. Go and see that if you want to read more about that, or hear more about that rather. Pubo rectalis goes from the pubis around the rectum. Pubo coccygeus, look, here's, here are the sacral bones, here are the coccygeal bones. Um, so pubo coccygeus goes across here. But iliococcygeus, if that's coming across here, why is it called iliococcygeus if the ilium's up here and maybe it's good, it's, I don't know, I'm a bit confused by that. Anyway, levator ani forms the floor of the pelvis, supporting the viscera within it, and not just the viscera, but everything else that's stacked above it within the abdomen, right? So it's really important because you've got your abdominal wall muscles right here, you've got your diaphragm, you've got your pelvic floor. <laughs> It's all got to work together to, to hold on to everything that's inside and any weakness will herniate in. But we're not here to talk about the pelvic floor. Um, so levator ani, pelvic floor, and then part of the wall is formed by another muscle, coccygeus and so on. And if we look at this externally, look, so this is from the inferior perspective. Can you see that that's curved there as well? The point I'm trying to make is that the, the pelvic floor, levator ani, is, is this curved hammock slung from the muscle, uh, slung from the bones, which is supporting the pelvic viscera and the sphincters and stuff that go through it, right? And we're getting there, we're getting there, honest. If here we're inside the pelvis, here, if we're on this side of levator ani, we are no longer in the pelvis, we are in the perineum. So perineum is a word that gets used for a couple of different things. So this is the anal aperture, this is the vaginal opening here. So that region of skin between the two gets called the perineum. But in fact, anatomically, we also refer to this whole space here as perineum. This, this region, this space is perineum. Look, see this is the, the anal opening, the anal aperture. So this is the anal canal. I've got a whole video on the anal canal as well. Go and see that one. Um, can you see how it's, it's, it's proud, it's sticking out, right? It's, if this is levator ani here, then this is the anal canal in here. So the anal canal is actually in the perineum, okay? So that's my point, is that on the other side of levator ani we have the perineum. Now, let's go back to the bony things a moment. Pelvis bony things. So here's the, the pubis, and you can palpate the pubis, right? It's this bony part here. And here and here, these are the ischial tuberosities. You can palpate these as well. The ischial tuberosities are what you sit on when you sit down, right? Those two 
bony bits there, here and here. The ischial tuberosities are also what the hamstrings um, arise from. That's the origin of the hamstrings and they go down the back of the leg. So, and then we have this strip of bone here. Um, now, if this is the pubis and this is the ischial tuberosity, so pubis and ischium, this is a ramus, ramus literally meaning branch, like branch from a tree, from, I think Latin, is it Latin or Greek? Um, so this then is the ischiopubic ramus. All right, so we've got pubis, ischiopubic ramus, and then ischial tuberosity. Around here we've got the coccyx and the sacrum. You see this ligament here? This ligament is coming from the sacrum and it's going to the ischial tuberosity. So we'll call that the um, sacro-tuberous ligament. Sounds like a good name, right? And now we've made this, this aperture. It looks quite different when you haven't got the ligaments there, you've got stranger spaces. But we've also kind of made this diamond shape, right? Do you see that? We've got kind of a diamond shape there. And if we add levator ani and these other bits back, you can see that diamond shape again. So essentially, if you're within that diamond shape and you're inferior to levator ani, you're within the perineum. And we break the perineum up into two, into two triangles. So, if you draw a line from the ischial tuberosities across here, we then have an anal triangle back here, and we have a urogenital triangle anteriorly. And these two spaces have two different functions. The, the anal canal, that wants to either hold in feces in the rectum or allow feces to pass through with defecation. So the anal canal um, wants to, uh, for during defecation, it wants to be able to open up to allow the stool to pass through and then be closed up again. Which means that back here, on this model, we don't see anything. And in life, this, these spaces are filled with fat and we have a few blood vessels and nerves passing through. But what that means is that the fat is supporting the anal canal, but during defecation, the, the fat can be moved aside to allow the stool to pass through, um, and then the fat moves back into place afterwards, right? So that's the anal triangle, whereas anteriorly in the urogenital triangle we've, we've got a different function. We've got, in this case, these are the female external genitalia. We need to be able to anchor the erectile tissues to something so they're firm and in place. And you see that levator ani is this curved bowl thing, so what we do is we find this sheet here, there is a perineal membrane, and the perineal membrane is attached to the uh, ischiopubic ramus here, and then it runs from ischial tuberosity across to ischial tuberosity and back up, attached to the ischiopubic ramus on the other side. So it's a triangular, dense, connected tissue sheet anchored to the bones there. And look, it's got this posterior free edge here. We can see on this model that we have a superficial perineal muscle lining that edge, but this is the perineal membrane, um, and this is the the posterior free edge of the perineal membrane. So now that means that if you imagine skin overlying this, then between the perineal membrane and the skin, we have a, a superficial perineal pouch, and that's where we find all of the erectile tissues anchored and supported. And then look here, because the uh, levator ani muscle is, is curved because it's a bowl and the perineal membrane is kind of flat-ish. That means we've kind of got this triangular space shape deep to the perineal membrane. The space deep to the perineal membrane then is the deep perineal pouch. These spaces are interesting because we have structures running through them. Like you see here, here we have a uh, 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 a, a neurovascular bundle. And what we have here is we have the pudendal nerve and the internal pudendal artery, the internal pudendal vein. Now the pudendal nerve is important in this region because it is the major sensory nerve to structures around here. It's also gonna supply some sympathetic innovation and bits and bobs. 
and it's going to supply perineal branches to all sorts of things within the perineum. So the pudendal nerve is crucial for sexual function, for normal sexual function. And you can see that it's passing through here and passing into that deep perineal pouch. And uh, the internal pudendal artery is going to supply blood to the erectile tissues and the internal pudendal vein is going to drain blood from those erectile tissues. So those are going to go, in this case this being the female pelvis, these structures are going to go deep to the perineal membrane and then they're going to pop out with the clitoris and supply blood to the erectile tissues around there. All right, so where are we at? Right, um, oh, one thing is that uh, I mentioned this in the anal canal video as well, that this space here between the, the anal canal and the ischium is the ischio-anal fossa because it's a bit, it's a little depression, right? Ischio-anal fossa, very sensibly named. Um, but we have talked about, well, I'm not going to talk about levator ani and the pelvic floor in detail, I've done that elsewhere. Um, but you can see how we've got this, this space of perineum, which is this kind of diamond shape uh, between the levator ani and the skin. We have this posterior anal triangle, this anterior urogenital triangle. We've got this perineal membrane, uh, which is anchored to the bony bits here. And then to the perineal membrane, the erectile tissues of the female external genitalia are attached to that. Uh, and that gives us a superficial perineal pouch superficial to it between the skin and the perineal membrane and a deep perineal pouch between the perineal membrane and the levator ani muscle group. Uh, another interesting structure around here is that between the um, anal canal and the um, perineal membrane or in this region here, so between the anal canal and the opening of the vagina, there is the perineal body. The perineal body is like a, an anchoring site, an attachment site for all of the structures around here. If you look inside it, it's got smooth muscle in it and skeletal muscle and connective tissue and collagen and all sorts. Um, the external anal sphincters attached to it, the perineal membranes attached to it, these superficial perineal muscles are attached to it. It's a really important anchoring site for all of these structures. It used to be the case that uh, when obstetric surgeons performed an episiotomy to, uh, so if uh, a mum is, or if a birth is progressing a little bit too slowly and we need to uh, make the opening larger um, to speed up the delivery, an episiotomy is often used. Um, before tearing occurs because the cut is more predictable than the tearing. The old thinking was, I think, that you used to, ke you used to cut inferiorly because the, it was thought that the perineal body, because it's mostly connective tissue, would be really good at repairing. Turns out it's not. And by damaging the, the perineal body, many mums then had later prolapses of various structures and problems with fecal continence and that sort of thing. So nowadays, an episiotomy cuts kind of from the med medial line to laterally to avoid the perineal body because the perineal body is a really, really important structure supporting all of these other structures. So be careful of your perineal body. Um, but that's there. Something else we could talk about while we're here and something else I was talking about with the students here when we were talking about the perineum were also the erectile tissues of the female external genitalia because it's uh, female reproduction week. Um, it's difficult. There's only so much we can see on a model but there are a number of erectile tissues in the female perineum and they match the erectile tissues in the male perineum. Embryologically, we both, both male and female, start from kind of a, an indifferent default with the same sort of embryological structures. And then depending upon whether you have male or female hormones, the external genitalia get down, driven down different routes of morphogenesis, forming different shapes and stuff. So they start from the same basic structures, which explains why male and female adult structures are similar. Um, laterally, there are two crura, and these are running along these ischiopubic rami again. And then we have, we can see one here, two bulbs of the vestibule. So there's a bulb of the vestibule here and a bulb of the vestibule there. Um, these lie deep to labia majora, but there's also a fair bit of fat around here. Um, and then we have the clitoris up here. And the clitoris has, so these two crura come together and they, there are two erectile spaces within the clitoris and the clitoris also has a glans like the penis does which is a third erectile space and when if you cut a cross section through the penis you'll see two corpora cavernosa and then one corpus spongiosum which is continuous with the glans and we see the same thing in the clitoris so those same basic tissues are are present, so the clitoris is analogous with the penis. Um, the di main difference is that the clitoris doesn't carry a urethra like the penis does, and the size difference, of course. So we've got these erectile tissues, and the erectile tissues are like sinusoidal spaces. They can fill with blood, and they're surrounded by 
a flexible, firmish connective tissue. It's just like a balloon when they're inflated. That, erect, that, that um, connective tissue kind of determines the shape and size. And what happens during erection is that, so most of the time, most of the time in erectile tissues, there is an arterial supply, so like arterioles coming into the tissue. And in, and in most tissues in the body, we'll have these arterioles coming in and then they'll pass blood across a capillary bed and most of that blood will be collected from the capillary bed by venules on the venous side, right? Some of that occurs in the erectile tissues, but um, you've also got arterioles carrying arterial blood into the erectile tissues and pretty much directly connecting to venous structures taking the blood away again. So you have these arteriovenous anastomoses. Blood goes in, blood goes out again, blood goes in, blood goes out again. That's what normally happens. Now during sexual arousal, the parasympathetic um, part of the nervous system, the parasympathetic part of the autonomic nervous system, causes a few things to happen. It causes um, vasodilation, which is nitric oxide mediated, which is how Viagra works. Um, and that means that more blood passes into the erectile tissues. And then we see that these erectile tissues here, the bulbs of the vestibule are covered by a bulbospongiosis muscle. Um, so bulb of the vestibule, bulbo, bulbospongiosis. Uh, the, the third erectile space in the penis is the corpus spongiosum, right? So bulbospongiosis muscle. And that squashes the vestibule and at the base of the clitoris. And then um, over the crura, we have the um, ischiocavenosus muscle, right? Ischium, corpora cavernosa, corpus cavernosum, cavernous space. So the ischiocavenosus muscle covers the crura, and these muscles then, part of what they do is when they contract, they impede venous return. They make it hard for the venous blood to get out of the erectile tissues. So the state you've got now is you've got more arterial blood going into the erectile tissues and less blood coming out. So those, those sinus spaces within the erectile tissues can fill with blood at arterial pressure and they inflate. This is erection so that these tissues become erect. Um, ta -da! <laughs> That's the anatomy behind um, erection and erectile tissue, erectile tissues. Obviously, um, that occurs during sexual arousal, so when that arousal ends, then the muscles relax and arterial, uh, the ar arterial supplying blood will get constricted again, so less blood goes in and the venous blood can, can come out. All right, there you go. So that's the perineum. We're not anatomically really talking about the bit of skin here. We're talking about this whole space. And the pelvis is in here on this side of the levator rani. The perineum is inferior to levator rani. So the perineum is in this kind of diamond shape and it's between the levator rani muscle group and the skin. That's the perineum. We have the anal triangle, the urogenital triangle, and then we have those erectile tissues anchored to the perineal membrane, which itself is anchored to the bones there. The perineum doesn't get talked about a lot, but there's some quite good anatomy there. Um, footnote, um, the pudendal nerve is the pudendal nerve. It's just the pudendal nerve. There's no internal or external pudendal nerve. There's just a left pudendal nerve and a right pudendal nerve. Whereas the internal pudendal, nerve, pudendal artery, the internal pudendal artery is like, it's like the last part of the anterior trunk of the internal iliac artery here. And it has a cool way of getting out of the pelvis and into the perineum and supplying blood to all of these structures around here. The external pudendal artery is a branch of the femoral artery, which gets into the, uh, the anterior regions of uh, the perineum here. That's why there's an internal pudendal artery. It's because there's an external pudendal artery and likewise with the veins, but there's just a pudendal nerve. There is no internal pudendal nerve, okay? Um, all right, that'll do, I think. <laughs> See you guys next time.